War, religion and politics. Labor wins a landslide in the UK but loses a handful of seats to pro-Palestinian candidates. It comes as Australian Labor faces a similar threat after the defection of Senator Fatima Payman. I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. Sir Keir Starmer and the Labor Party are celebrating their historic election win in the UK. Here, Labor has just gone through a bruising week and the first defection in many years. Fatima Payman finally quit the ALP and will now sit as an independent senator for the remaining four years of her six-year Senate term. She says her conscience wouldn't allow her to stay, given Labor's failure to recognise a Palestinian state. Her former colleagues are angry. They accuse her of executing a carefully staged plot to inflict maximum damage on the party that put her into Parliament. If the same motion on recognising the state of Palestine was to be brought forward tomorrow, I would cross the floor. The internal crisis has distracted from the government's agenda in the important final sitting week before the long winter break. It is a pity uh, that uh, she has chosen uh, not to uh, participate as a team member. One of the responsibilities you have is that we stand together. I mean, chat GBT could do the job of a Labor senator any day of the week, so good on Senator Payman. There is a young woman in this parliament who's made a statement that she's been intimidated inside the Labor caucus. <laughs> The only concrete action you have taken is, is against those supporting Palestine. We are not served well as a country uh, by those who seek to bring the conflict here. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese is bracing for the defection of the government's youngest senator. I expect further announcements in coming days, which will uh, explain exactly what uh, the strategy has been over now more than a month. As you can see, there have been a group of protesters pro-Palestinians who have managed to get to a really difficult to reach part of the front of the building. Witnessing our government's indifference to the greatest injustice of our times makes me question the direction the party is taking. I'm torn, deeply torn, with a heavy heart but a clear conscience I announce my resignation from the Australian Labor Party. It's very clear that Fatima Payman is in the Senate because people in WA uh, wanted to elect a Labor government. You don't feel, though, that this seat belongs to the Labor Party? The voters wanted a Labor senator for that six-year Senate seat. Well, I've been speaking to a lot of rank-and-file members, um, but also people on the ground who feel that Labor is not doing enough on this matter. This whole saga could now unleash a new political movement. I don't want Australia to go down uh, the road of faith-based political parties, because what that will do is undermine social cohesion. I do not plan to form a party. Well, stay tuned. Thank you. And my guest this morning is the Greens Deputy Leader, Maureen Faruqi. First, let's check what's making news. In News Corp papers, a report's found an increase in gambling, public drunkenness and alcohol-related violence since axing the cashless debit card in Indigenous communities. James Campbell writes the findings confirm dire warnings made before Labor axed the card. The report was commissioned by the government and is based on interviews with people in the affected communities. The Sunday Age reports the University of Melbourne tracked students with CCTV footage and Wi-Fi location data as part of an investigation into those who took part in a pro-Palestinian sit-in at a campus building. Human rights experts say it's in breach of the university's own policies on using tracking technology. And finally, plenty of coverage about Joe Biden digging in during his interview yesterday with ABC America. The US president said only the Lord Almighty would convince him to pull out. The New York Times has interviewed more than 50 Democrats and says a growing number see his candidacy as unsustainable. More on that a little later. The war in Gaza has been testing social cohesion both here and in the UK, where pro-Palestinian candidates have taken a handful of seats from Labor. Our preferential voting system makes that more difficult, but not impossible. 
The Prime Minister is warning against the rise of faith-based parties. He fears sectarianism will only further undermine cohesion. It could also undermine Labor's vote. Let's see what the panel makes of it. We're joined this week by Phil Curry, Amy Ramikis and Katina Curtis. Very good morning to uh, all of you. Both. Look, let's start with um, the how and why of Fatima Payman's uh, exit from the Labor Party. Phil, she says it was a decision she only arrived at at the end. The Prime Minister says this was clearly carefully planned for weeks and weeks. Who's telling the truth? Um, well, <clears throat> we don't really know for sure, but <laughs> just based on our own interactions with the various players, mm. as this saga has unfolded, Dave, especially in the last week, it clearly wasn't a spontaneous decision just taken on Thursday to resign. Yeah. Um, far from it, and it clearly wasn't just because Prime Minister stood up in question time on Wednesday and said, you know, she's going to go in the next couple of days, which Senator Payman said was the, she was already going to go, I, I, I know. Um, <laughs> I was told by someone, make sure you're there Thursday. Uh, so, look, the Prime Minister's view is... It goes back to the day after the federal budget on May 15 when Senator Payman said from the river to the sea and was reprimanded from the Prime Minister for, for that. And in his view, that was basically the day they lost her. Um, yeah, you know, we know now that she'd been... She started talking to people... So around yeah, that, well, around the, the, the Muslim vote right people and Glenn Drury and others and, and other advisers, she says. So, yeah, the, as far as the PN go, they, they lost her over a month ago. Yeah. She said two things to me in an interview I did with her on Thursday in terms of timing. One was that um, she was really strongly moved when she. Um, made a visit to the encampment at the Curtin University. She couldn't remember the exact date, but she thought it was around April. She was really struck by the fury of the students and she said to me, if I wasn't a senator, I would probably be there camping with them. And the second thing that she said was that she really felt like after she made that speech on May 15, the day after the budget, she said, I felt like I was on a, on a downward slope from there. Like, it was almost always inevitable once she'd made that first yeah. step that she was going to it would end up with her leaving the party. And a downward slope seems, Amy, to be probably the best description of what's happened here. I mean, <clears throat> you don't make the decision to quit right at the end, but a downward slope seems to be what she was on. Yeah, but I think we also need to put it into the context of what people have been seeing for the last nine months, uh, which is what's been happening in Gaza and in Palestine. And there is a huge disconnect at the moment between what the public is seeing and just the tsunami of human suffering that we've run out of words to describe, of man-made human suffering, and the, what the political establishment is saying. And Fatima Payman has been receiving all of those messages. And there has been a lot of talk about whether or not she spoke up in caucus, you know, how she prosecuted this in caucus. And I just think people need to remember, she's 29 years old, mm. she's a new political operative. It isn't necessarily the safest space as a woman of colour, to stand up and say, actually, I'm against what you're telling people here. You know, I want us to go further. Because we know that people with a lot more experience and a lot more political capital have been making those arguments in caucus and in cabinet and not particularly getting anywhere with it. So this argument that suddenly, that if she'd just spoken up, you know, that the, the Labor Party would have responded, I think is a red herring. Well, that's a fundamental problem, though, for Labor, if that's the case, if, if it's not a safe space, as you say, for people to raise a pretty important issue. Um, well, I, don't, I didn't get that impression. I mean, it's not like she was left by, on her own. I mean, you know, she, there was multiple... When they felt they were losing her, there was multiple efforts from the Prime Minister down to talk to her. Albanese, Albanese yeah. had an hour with her one Saturday morning a couple of weeks ago. I mean, even right up to the... <clears throat> pardon me, the point she crossed the floor... Both Ed Husek and, um, and Ann Ali, both Muslim members of the caucus, uh, rang her, texted her, asked, you know, come and speak. No response. She, she, she eschewed all uh, representations from colleagues. I mean, mm. as the Prime Minister said Friday, she never stood in caucus, and, and, or, and people on the left say she never stood in the left factional meeting. So she was in a. And I think Amy's right, she was under a considerable external pressure over this. But she, from what I hear, she never really sort of, you know, but, but I've heard drew, drew from her colleagues. At or, those sort yeah, of yeah. sub-caucus levels, mm. there were discussions. Had she was involved in those discussions, as mm. I understand it, including, mm. you know, yeah. times when um, Foreign Minister Penny Wong had come she had along. She the Foreign Minister. But, but that there... But there 
a colleague said that they never, there was never any point where she said anything that sounded like, you know, she I have quit. got to the point that I am so uncomfortable mm. with the party's position that I. But she did. Can't so she did this. meet with this organisation called the Muslim Vote, uh, which you know makes it clear on its website that it's about trying to put Labor into a minority government. Uh, she met with Glenn Drury through them as well, and after she quit Thursday night, I, I did ask her about those meetings and what that was all about. Meeting with Glenn Drury and the Muslim Vote group was just one of many other meetings that I've had with various other political strategists, politically minded, driven people and communities. Without, um, without considering leaving Labor? I was not thinking about leaving Labor. Is that credible that you meet um, Glenn Drury and an organisation that, you know, is about trying to put Labor in a minority without thinking about leaving Labor? Well, not in the eyes of her now former colleagues. I don't know. I don't know Senator Payman. And I, I wasn't there, but that, her, the Labor people don't believe. What do you think, Amy? Are, they, are these the sort of meetings that she says that are just meeting lots of community-minded groups? I think that... I think you can see in hindsight why her Labor colleagues have, have gone, this is an orchestrated plan, and why the, the, when the meetings came out that this, you know, caused that frenzy of this has been planned for a month and she's been doing this. I think that that really takes away from some of the senators' agency in this, and I think that it really takes away from what... that, that disconnect that I'm talking about between what she and other representatives are hearing on the ground about where they want their government to go and what the government position is. And, you know, we can argue the toss about how planned this was. But the point is, she has not strayed outside the Labor line on anything other than this particular issue. But she issue. flagged she might. But potentially now she's she might, but up until now, now that... she has not moved on anything. And mm. we've also we've all heard the social cohesion line and how much you know issues are arising from what Senator Payman has done. I would argue that if you're you know going for social cohesion, if that's so important, the fallout and how some of her former colleagues have reacted in terms of threatening threatening her with Section 44, and suddenly that's an issue where it wasn't an issue with pre-selection dropping out all of the stories, all of the backgrounding. What is that doing to social cohesion? What message is that sending people who are standing behind Senator Payman saying you have acted on your conscience and you're speaking for us? I actually... Sorry, I, I mean, I actually think that there's a great irony in all of this in that, the, as you say, the, the one issue that she has strayed from the Labor line, that issue, I mean, that's far more important to voters in Western Sydney than it is to voters in Western yeah. Australia. Like, I, I think that that's kind of an incredible irony in this and here she is now. She's saying she's going to be a voice for people in WA. Yes, she is getting, you know, a, a swell of feedback from the party rank and file, but I, I've been trying to get my head around this for, you know, for mm. six months, like how big of an issue is this actually for people in WA? Um, the, other, the other federal politicians from this say, well, you know, we're getting a small amount of correspondence, but we're not hearing well, a does lot. It, does it come there hasn't been the, the huge says. protests that we've seen what elsewhere. Did, what did voters in WA vote for? Mm. Mm. Well, yeah. she got more They've... above the line votes than Glenn Stirl. So, you know, like, you know, when the Prime Minister was making the point that people voted for her as a Labor representative, of course that's true. That's always the yeah, way that the Senate leave works. The Labor Party. No, but I'm just saying, <laughs> like, she still, as a first term senator, got sure. more above the line votes. Sure, but and I so. take the point that maybe it is not a top of mind issue because, yes, cost of living is everything. But I think we're seriously underestimating just how much people do actually care about this. It's not politics, it is the shared experience of human suffering. But Katina's right, in some parts of uh, Western Sydney in particular, it's a much, much bigger issue than, than elsewhere. Uh, our ABC colleague Nabil Al Nasher, in fact, went there, spoke to some of those uh, in those Western Sydney seats in particular. Muslims should vote to get the Prime Minister out from whatever he's doing, because this genocide is still happening. Highly unlikely. A lot of them have a lot of different beliefs. Most of them don't think the same, don't go to the same mosque or live in the same areas. They have to lose. They shouldn't be allowed to win in the next election. There has to be a vote to defeat them. They're not standing up for Palestine as much as we would expect them to. So they're not really meeting our requirements. Yeah, so that's the sentiment that Labor will be worried about, although, you know, one making the point there that n not all Muslims agree necessarily on, on everything. Um, and so that's Western Sydney. But to your point, 
Yes, there, there is some uh, clearly support for her in WA as well, where she's from. She flew back there, arrived at Perth Airport and have a look at the reception she got. Yeah, so a show of support for her there at Perth Airport uh, as, she, as she came home. But look, um, the Muslim vote, let's just talk a little bit about that. Phil, what is this organisation? Look, it's, it is, as they say, they're, they're an alliance of community organisations. It's not a... It start, it's, it's been quite active in Britain. They have a... They have, their website in Britain's almost a carbon copy of the South... Uh, sorry, the, the Australian one. And they were similarly engaged in the uh, British election. The and they, they rank Yeah, they MPs. had, all, these, they had all, the, uh, all the MPs with the uh, rank by high percentage of uh, Muslim voters in their seats and their voting record on... It was, it was a carbon copy of what's going on here. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Same as their website Same here. Saying this one's pro-Palestinian, this one's pro-Israel. Yeah, this how one's they weak on strong. this thing, that, 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 that motion, did they support this thing in Parliament? And then, and then the one in Australia, I think it's the top, there's 27 MPs, 25 of which are Labor, and there's Di Lee and uh, David Coleman, the Liberal from Banks, and it's the same thing. And then they give this sort of subjective assessment. I mean, you know, they said Tony Burke is weak on Palestine. I, I think, you know, it's... I don't think... Tony Burke was being called an anti-Semite not long ago because he wasn't standing up for Israel. You know, it, it sort of shows the invidious position some of these people are put in. I mean, Labor is the party of government. They can't go all one way or the other. And they... And it's, you know, and it's very easy to sort of, you know... La Labor has shifted quite a lot on Palestine since they came, came into government. I mean, before, before the terrorist attacks on October 7, which we seem to hear less about these days, I mean, you know, remember they changed their language on the occupied territories, they... Yeah. they, they and they're now willing the to recognise the Jerusalem as the capital. Before it's, I mean, uh, Netanyahu d disliked Albanese so much that after the terrorist attacks, he wouldn't take his call for three weeks. Yeah. Anyway, look, mean, the, the Prime Minister is now... Yeah, so, um, warning against the, the rise of religious-based, yeah. faith-based candidates and, and parties. Here he was on Friday. I don't think and don't want Australia to go down uh, the road of faith-based political parties because what that will do is undermine social cohesion. Would it undermine social cohesion? Let's not pretend this is new. And let's not pretend that this is just, you know, like like the Muslim vote. We have seen it with the ACL. We have seen it with Catholics. We could argue that some of the incrementalism in Australia's social policy is, you know, same-sex marriage has been because of how it would upset the apple cart with particular religious groups. This is not a new thing that is it's happening. It's not like religion has been no, absent from politics. No, no, it, it has never... I mean, the Labor Party, of all people, like, of all parties, who literally split religion in the 1950s... But this would be if... if I mean, it's interesting, because if you had a um, self-described Muslim candidate mm. running federally on the issue of being Muslim, mm. that would be a little bit That's different. That's a step up, yeah. That, yeah. that might be, but then we've had, like, the Christian Democrat Party, yeah, where they well. literally ran on, the on being yeah. Christian. Mm. And so this and this big scare campaign that, you know, all suddenly we might have, you know, more Muslim people. We have Muslim people in the parliament. Mm. They're capable of caring about but a they whole didn't, bunch they didn't, of yeah. different The point issues. is, the difference is they didn't run as uh, I'm running because... Uh, you know, I want to represent but it, Muslim issues. But even on, with the Muslim vote people, it's not even necessarily that it's just Islam that they're running on. They're running on, like, the issue of Palestine. And we have had single-issue parties. Like, you could say that, you know, yeah. it comes down to integrity, it comes down to climate. Do you think they need to perhaps change their name, though? Because, I mean, they make that point. They say we're not a religious party, but they call the religion. Muslim... Look, I, 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 I do worry. I mean... I mean, I was, you know, any of those of us who were around in the aftermath of 9-11 and, uh, you know, what, what happened then in society with Islamophobia and stuff. And uh, as Albanese said, he said he fears for what it would do to the actual Islamic mm. community in terms of backlash. And what was it? Early, on, early on Thursday, Hanson was straight... Came, Pauline Hanson came off the long run with a... Mm. Nobody uh, ever uh, argued the Christian Democrats needed oh, to change I know, that. I know, I, I'm I know, saying but, what, but like... It wasn't just saying, as inflammatory. Well, just saying that because Australia is xenophobic, that therefore a group should not, you know, well, actually name themselves... OK, like, knock yourselves out. But, you know, it, it, it's, you know it's just, it's just the reality you've got to deal one with. one of the you know, bigger <laughs> issues of, like, what we're dealing with behind all of this. I mean, one of the biggest issues that people who are caring about Palestine and being anti-genocide have been talking about with the government is that they don't see the sanctions that they would, you know, that the US and the UK are doing yep. on Israeli settlements. Yep. And all those are, are fair... They're um, not seeing any of the government react no, exactly. to that. These are all political points to make and substantive points to make, but it's about whether you're running on those issues or running 
because of your religion mm. as, as the, the reason for being the candidate. I mean, the Greens can make those points, and they make them very strongly, and I'm sure Senator Faruqi will in the, in the next few minutes. We've and, always yeah. had people of particular interest groups want to promote mm. their yeah. interests. That's very true. Mm. That's very true. Uh, look, this whole issue about religion in politics is one aspect that's sort of emerged, uh, particularly this week. But the, another uh, aspect of Fatima Payman's exit is... Labor's rules around solidarity in the caucus mm -hmm. and whether they need to relax, uh, obviously she thinks they should. Katina, what, are, what do you reckon? Is there going to be any, any movement there? I think that there is a real uh, a disconnect and a fear from some within the caucus that this was going to be an increasing problem. Um, there's, yes, there's always been young activists, you know, in every generation who always want the party to do more. I think there is increasingly... You're seeing that now, particularly social media, is enabling those people to kind of go out and um, campaign on their own and, you know, increase awareness or following or get people to act without having to be part of a political party. So I think there is something that the party is going to have to grapple with. Mm. This week is not the time, you know, in no. the heat of the moment is not the time. And the it's party president, Wayne Swan, has yeah. put out a statement saying, <laughs> and it's you know, been really, budging. It's, it's worked been... so well for 100 plus years, yeah. he says. So. Um, I think there is too, you know, people say, well, OK, if you crack caucus solidarity open a little bit, then what, what about cabinet solidarity? You know, and there are arguments being put about the, the caucus solidarity means that... But that even before this people up, know what. There, there have been for. some in Labor arguing. I've got to relax uh, a little. In fact, uh, check out this book, Chris Bowen, Hearts and Minds. Bestseller. <laughs> Bestseller uh, from 2013. And look, here's what he said. I would argue, he said, for a system clearly, closely based on the UK model, uh, which involves no penalties for MPs who decide to cross the floor and vote against the position. Um, they're requested to support the position, but, you know, no penalty for crossing the floor. Anyway, that was more than a decade yeah. ago he wrote that. Look, look, both systems are imperfect, you know, having a free vote or, or, or a bound vote, but, you know, Labor has been served really well by having, as someone said, whether Hawke and Keating wouldn't have been able to reform the economy in the 80s. The metal workers from the left, there's no way they, they had to vote to, you know, remove tariffs. That was, you know, that was sacred to them. I mean, it's, you know, sometimes it works. Uh, and the, the, point, the thing I point out, the Liberal Party, it works quite well, but if you only got a majority of one or two, it doesn't work quite well. And remember Malcolm Turnbull when he had a one-seat majority and that was weaponised. George you know? Christensen yeah. said George yeah. Christensen every, every other week. week. Every week we're going to cross yeah, the but the, I mean, the thing is, you got... Uh, it, look, it, it, it can work, but it can also be very destabilising. Yeah. Oh, but these democracy. caucus rules, we're, well, in, yeah, a, but it, we're in an we era of um, greater individualism uh, and a lot of young people, I think, in particular, look at this idea that you have to be bound to a position. Well, and I think it's crazy. Well, if, I think particularly if you're... Uh, like, there's political issues and then there's issues of conscience. Mm -hmm. And if you're bound to a political position because of these rules and your conscience is saying elsewhere and you've got nowhere else to go other than to leave the party, then you have the situation like what we've happened. Yeah. Why this was not an issue of conscience is something for the Labor Party and I know what they're talking about with social cohesion and that would be what they would say but there is a giant chunk of voters who are saying I am seeing this every single day why are my representatives not reacting with the same amount of yeah. horror but you saw this yeah. sorry so you saw I mean you saw this before there's a, a few people have drawn this parallel to me this week with Joe Bullock who was also a WA Labor senator he was also in the Senate for two years though he was obviously m m much older than Fatima Payman is, he said once the once the party decided that a vote on same-sex marriage was not going to be a conscience vote, they had to be bound to the party position. He said, "I I cannot do that. I cannot vote for same-sex marriage," and he left Parliament completely and and let the party mm. hold on to that seat. Well, I mean, he's a good true blue Labor <laughs> warrior, isn't he? Well, it's worked. <laughs> All right, well, time to talk to the Greens Deputy Leader, Maureen Faruqi, and to take us there, here was Labor's Senate Leader, Penny Wong, on the Greens refusing to support a motion to recognise a Palestinian state as part of a just and enduring peace. Last week, they couldn't bring themselves to support this motion. The need for the Senate to recognise the state of Palestine as part of a peace process in support of a two-state solution and a just and enduring peace. I mean, what does it say Order. about how much you are focused on political differentiation <laughs> that you could not support that? You could not support that because all you want to do, Senator Faruqi uh, and your colleagues, is to politically differentiate on this conflict, which is horrific. 
Senator Faruqi, welcome to the program. Hi, David. Lovely to be here. It's my first time. Lovely to have you here. Uh, so, look, why? just explain to us why you couldn't support that motion Penny Wong's talking about there. So, we put up a very simple motion to recognise the statehood of Palestine. Then Labour started to amend that motion, and from where we sat, they were putting in caveats, they were delaying, they were kicking the can of Palestinian recognition down the road. That is not what the community is asking for. 150 other countries have done this, recognised simply that Palestine has statehood and Labour should do the same. And I am really sick and tired, David, of being gaslighted in that parliament by Labour Party uh, in kind of questioning the motivations of the Greens. We have been staunch supporters of injustice everywhere, and we have been strong supporters of justice for Palestine, not just over the last nine months, but over many years. That's the motivation. We are listening to our communities. We are looking at what is happening when 40,000 Palestinians have now been slaughtered. There is a genocide going on there. That's why we're putting pressure on the Labour government to act in a way that actually makes a difference. OK. Well, just to be clear on genocide, I, I just need to point out Israel denies that. There's been no finding from the International Court of Justice uh, of genocide. But why not support recognition um, as part of a just and enduring peace? Surely that's something you would support. Well, we have a situation here where Israel, who, and I will say that, who has slaughtered 40,000 Palestinians over the last nine months is recognised as a state. And then we have the situation where Palestinians are being denied that very same right. Let's bring that to an equal footing. Then let's talk about peace. Let's do something to stop this slaughter and talk... Like, I, I just... Is, 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 I was is, flabbergasted mm -hmm. that Labour wants to talk about peace well, while doing absolutely nothing to stop um, Israel from their slaughter of Palestinians. Is the continued presence of Hamas, though, the problem here? I mean, it is still holding civilian Israeli hostages. I mean, Hamas... Surely has... that has to end first. Hamas has nothing to do with recognising Palestinian statehood. Recognising Palestinian statehood is about Palestinians being able to self-determine. And they will self-determine... What does that mean? What does self-determine mean? Just explain how that well, would that work. is a very basic human right... Mm -hmm. For every person. But in this complicated context between Israel and Palestine, how would self determine what would that self determination look like? Well, firstly, the genocide has to stop, right? Uh, Palestinians have to be given more rights to be able to access basic necessities like food and water, mm. to be able to move around freely. But Palestine in terms of forming two states, how does self determination work? But that's a process that the UN has actually um, highlighted, and that's what needs to happen. So how does this it work? slaughter needs to finish, and Israelis and Palestinians need to look at what their region looks like. And do the hostages they, also they need to be released? Be, the hostages should be released. I think we've said, them, said that over and over. The, the hostages on the other side, the thousands upon mm. thousands of Palestinians that have been held by Israel, need also to be released. And does Hamas need to be dismantled? Well, listen, the, the situation with Hamas is... That it has nothing, I can't keep repeating it again and again, it has nothing to do with Palestinian statehood and Palestinian self -determination. No, the question was, does Hamas Once need to be that, dismantled? The Palestinians need to decide where they want to go with their own region, not intervention from Western countries. So if they choose Hamas, that's OK? Um, David, that is such... Um, what can I say? Like, we're creating this hypothetical scenario of what Palestinians, if and when they get self-determination... Well, it's not hypothetical to ask, should Hamas be ..rather than actually mm. questioning the Labour government hard on why they aren't stopping this slaughter, why they aren't putting sanctions uh, on Israel. That's the question okay. to ask, not a hypothetical, theoretical scenario that probably is never likely to happen. Well, let me ask you one more time, and this isn't hypothetical. Do you think Hamas should be dismantled? Hamas is listed as a terrorist organisation and there is no, absolutely no change that we are demanding in that. Should it be dismantled? Hamas is an organisation that exists in the region that we are talking about here, right? Who is going to... Who will dismantle it? It is up to 
the people in Palestine and that region to make sure that people can live in peace. But I, I will say this again. At the moment, only some people in that region mm. have the rights that every human deserves. Okay, but and surely the you can say them don't. Surely you're able to say whether you'd like to see them gone. I mean, it's not up to me to say who should be gone or not. Well, you've offered it's views to, on. Uh, it's up to me to say okay. that the 40,000 people that are being that have been killed and that the slaughter is going on. 16 Palestinians was, were killed just this morning in a strike mm. at a Palestinian school. Mm. That is what needs to stop, and then there needs to be a process to start started to, to see how peace can be attained and maintained and with the that, freedom of everyone that lives in that region. And would that peace uh, with self-determination still allow for an Israeli state? I mean, Israeli states exist, yes. But you would but like the to see... the state of Israel exists. You would like to see it continue to exist? Of course, there's no question about that. Okay. There is no question about that. The question here is that the Palestinians are being denied a state by Israel and by Australia, by the US, by these Western countries who refused to act against what Israel is doing. Now, this issue obviously uh, led to Senator Fatima Payman leaving the, the Labor Party. Did you have any role in encouraging her on this journey, on this path that she's been on? What was your contact with her? I've been in touch with um, Senator Payman um, over the last few weeks and also way before that. I think being the only other brown Muslim woman in that Senate, I can understand far better than most what Senator Payman has been going through, not just over the last few weeks, but just in general. I mean, Explain I Explain that to us. That's interesting. Yeah, just because I, throughout my political life, I have been a target of Islamophobia. I have been a target of gaslighting. Um, you know, I have been, uh, you know, vilified for, for strong positions that I have taken. Um, and so, you know, I, I can understand what Senator Payman is going through. And this issue of Palestine is very core to not just the Greens, mm. but personally to me as well. Did you encourage her at all to think about joining the Greens? No, I did not. Okay. And I do think, I completely agree with Amy, and this has been really bugging me over these last few weeks, that, that we are, like, there's a question about Senator Payman's agency. And again, again, that comes down to how Muslim women are stereotyped in this country, how they are boxed into uh, this person who can't make up their own minds, you know, that they are led by someone else. Someone else forced them to do this. Someone else forced them to, or encouraged them mm. to, to make a decision um, that they wholly made on by themselves. Senator Payman, as far as I can see it, made this decision on her moral compass, following her moral compass, listening to the community, um, and back, actually looking at what the situation in um, Israel is at the moment. That's how, and, and, you know, I'm very proud of her as another Muslim woman of, uh, for standing strong on her convictions. What about this organisation, The Muslim Vote? How do you view this organisation? So I, I'll first say that people of colour and Muslims have for too long been ignored in this country. That's to make one point. Uh, migrant communities have been ignored for too long in this country. You know, politicians from both the old parties ha have for years, decades, used us um, as tokens, as photo opportunities at our religious events, but have never actually deemed to address the issues that affect these communities. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't find it surprising at all that communities are organizing and communities are saying, well, you know, we want our voices heard. And do, one do, way to do this is to actually organize and to put up candidates who will be speaking up for the community. And from where I, from, from what I know, whether they are Muslim or not, it is about those candidates speaking for those communities and their concerns. And one of their big concerns yeah, and that, and at the moment is, is no what's action from Gaza. Labour no, on Palestine. No doubt about that. Um, but is, is it just to this issue that the Prime Minister has raised about um, sectarianism, mm -hmm. the, the warning he's issued about faith-based candidates or, or parties? Do you share that concern? It sounds like you're saying as long as they're trying to represent the mm. concerns of the, of the community, that's, that's OK. But if they're, if they're running on their religion, is that an issue for you? Well, you know, we start our day 
in the Senate with, uh, with the Lord's Prayer. Let's mm. not forget that. Um, and as much as I would love for our parliaments to be secular, I completely believe in a secular parliament. You'd like to get rid of the Lord's Prayer? Of church and state. Mm. I would like to get rid of it because, you know, we, so many peoples of different faiths mm. um, and from all over the world live in this country. And that is not representative. Mm. But on this Parliament issue, is not representative. No, uh, yeah. Hear your point on that. So this this issue the PM's raised though about faith-based, religious-based candidates is that a concern for you? It is not a concern for me. People have a right to you know to to have faith in this country, and people have a right to express that faith. Mm. Um, and it is absolutely disgraceful that Labour has been kind of you know unsourced whispers on you know kind of vilifying Senator Payman for expressing her faith. I mean, that is ridiculous. We had and the CDP. The... I was in New South Wales Parliament when the CDP was in the balance of power and parties for, for were very years, happy to years. do deals with them. Will the Greens um, compete no against... No one raised the hue and cry about that. Will the Greens compete against such candidates or cooperate with them? Well, we in New South Wales, we do have... We usually run candidates in, in every electorate and I think time will tell depending on what policies these candidates have. That's how we determine how we work with other candidates. Is it fair to say you, the Greens would focus on the inner city and perhaps these independent candidates on the western suburbs? Well, that's what I understand, that the independent candidate, the teal yeah. style independent candidates will be more focused in, in Western Sydney. But obviously we will be running campaigns uh, across New South Wales, across Australia, because there's a Senate vote to be, okay. um, you know, one as well. But I want to ask you about protests, because the Greens mm. uh, have been sharing, well, lots of videos and so on. This video was the latest. It's the protest that took place at mm. Parliament House on Thursday. Um, it was a security breach. The building was shut down to the public. School kids and so on weren't allowed in. Um, the Greens sharing this video, uh, are you really encouraging this sort of behaviour then? Um, David, I have been to protests, I think, every single week uh, over the last nine months. We have a right to protest in this country. Mm. We have a right to peacefully protest in this country. But a security breach at Parliament House, you're a senator. Is that something you want to encourage? We're not encouraging um, any protests that are, you know, violent. And I think it was a bit rich of the Prime Minister to say that kind of unfurling a banner from the, the top of the Parliament House was somehow not a peaceful protest. Well, it's, this was it's, a peaceful it protest. It is a breach of security, though. It, it forces the building to be shut down, the Australian Parliament. Sure, I understand that. But let's also put this into perspective. People are really angry. Understand they have that. been really angry now for months and months. Their government, their prime minister, people who they voted for, who they thought would represent them, have not represented them, have not even what listened about targeting... to them, have not even spoken to them. What like, about what are people the... supposed to no, do? I heard that. What about targeting the war memorial? Is that okay as well? So, I mean, I again think that talking about some paint on a building rather than the, it's a rather what's important happening building, though, in isn't it? Israel? So, is this, this is a this is a pretty sacred building for a lot of. So people. I I wouldn't have done it, but I know I understand that people are angry and people people want some way. So that's of, okay. Of the government to listen to them, and if the prime minister is interested in you know people not protesting, then he should sit down with his community, his own community in Grendler. Talk well, to speaking them, of that, you've also been there. I'll, I'll, I'll show you that this is what you've been posting, various images of the protest outside the Prime Minister's electorate office in, in Marrickville. Uh, and, and you've been sharing a, a lot of these videos and images as well. It has seen the office shut down for months. People can't get in to access the services that they need to access. Why do you need to blockade an electorate office? The electorate office, firstly, is not blockaded. Um, it has David, been can shut I down, say that? And staff well, have the, apparently the, the been Prime Minister abused, made that decision. spat on... Um, I, I, I don't know about that, but like people do have a right to go outside the Prime Minister's office and request, request um, that he meet them. The Prime Minister should just meet them rather than blaming those who are protesting a genocide. Are you exploiting the tragedy in Gaza for political gain? I find that, I'm sorry to say, really offensive. Really offensive, David. Well, this Those is what this is what the Prime Minister yeah, and the well, Foreign I Minister find that really constantly accuse you know, of. I'm just asking you. Do you. Absolutely, they are saying that they are accusing us of causing division, and like I said earlier, that is gaslighting, raising an issue that thousands upon thousands 
of Australians, and it's not just Muslims, it's not just Arabs. I can tell you, I get it, uh, someone in my community gets in touch with me every single day, and I'm not exaggerating, mm. to say how grateful they are for the Greens for being their voice on this do you, issue. Do you feel any responsibility to dial down the temperature on this? This whole, you were talking about this earlier on social cohesion and how, you know, I, I find that also, you know, kind of very weird that here we have two major parties who, at, right at this time, are dog whistling on migrants and on international students, uh, which is really harming and hurting the community, stand there and say, oh, we need social cohesion. You know the message that the community is getting is, you shut up. You, you have no right to talk about this. That's what social cohesion is about, mm. to, sh to shutting up people who are saying things that the government doesn't like. That's not good enough. That is not good enough. We should have a voice. And people are even more angry than at now, the only voice uh, in the Labour Party who has kind of spoken out against this issue, has you know, has been treated the way that Senator Payman has been treated. And now sitting on the crossbench. Uh, look, Senator Fariki, we will have to leave it there. But thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for having me, David. All right. Well, we're going to talk more about what's happened in the UK election as well, where about five seats Labor held have gone to pro-Palestinian independence. And we'll look at, uh, well, the landslide Labor win that also happened at that election the other day. First, let's continue this conversation. And back to our panel, Phil Curry, Amy Ramikas and Katina Curtis. Uh, Phil, just quickly on, on that, the Greens obviously not taking a backward step at all uh, when it comes to these issues and the protests as well. No, no, but you wouldn't expect that. That's their, that's their position and they've been, been consistent on it. Um, probably said, I think Senator Payman's views are far more in accordance with the Greens than Labor. Um, and uh, Look, my only thing is we're sort of ripping ourselves apart over something as a, as a government or a nation we can have most minimal influence on and I think that's the, really the, the issue here and Senator Payman's week has been a microcosm of that um, she's she's just you know her, her, her feelings are genuine her views are genuine and she just can't feel she doesn't feel that the party she's a member of can adequately reflect them so she's left I mean that's really the summary of what we're doing here well let's let's move on to where the government wanted to be talking about cost of living this week with the tax cuts flowing the wage rise uh, various other budget goodies as well the coalition also clearly had cost of living on their mind as well both think that this is the, the big issue uh, and and will be at the election Peter Dutton had uh, a policy to announce as well this is get tough on supermarkets Markets, if they're found to be misusing market power, they can be forced to break up or sell stores, Coles, Woolies, Bunnings. How would it actually work, Katina? It's <laughs> that's 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 a giant question. It seems really unclear. Um, there was definitely some division within the Liberal Party over the Liberals adopting this policy. Um, it, it's been put to me that the split was broadly between the sort of rural, regional versus the metro Liberals. Right. Um, but there were th those who were eventually talked around to it um, were saying, well, you know, the fact that the safeguards that have been put in, there's this public interest test, but the threshold has been set so high that in reality it's probably actually never going to be so used. So it wouldn't be used, it would be more of a, a threat? And I guess that's arguably how it works in the gas market mm. as well. Yeah, I and mean, that... like, it's, it's the old big stick that became a yeah. toothpick, you know, during <laughs> the, the Malcolm Turnbull years. But, I mean, and this is... Divestment is something that the Greens has been speaking about for a very long time, too, when it came to the big supermarkets. I think it speaks to a wider issue, though, that's going on within the opposition at the moment, is they have headline policies with no substance behind them. Mm. And so they managed to take a lot of space and air about, you know, they're going to do nuclear, they're going to to cut migration, they're going to do the supermarket divestment. But when you actually, like, dig in behind it, scratch through the surface, there's nothing there. And I think the proof is, as was said to me from several people who went to the LNP State Council um, conference, which is happening this weekend, is that they're getting tired of policies being announced and then a week later they're not being talked about anymore. Mm. Yeah, well, it's a, that's an interesting yeah. point, and I think it's going to be interesting. Mm. Uh, we'll, we'll come to what's going to happen over the winter break and yeah, what they yeah. need to talk more about. But uh, just on this supermarket idea, yeah. I mean, Katina talks about the... Some Libs weren't happy with this. About half a dozen in the party room yeah. did voice their concern. And, and, look, this was put to Peter Dutton. Mr Dutton, did you ambush your colleagues with this supermarket's policy? No. 
We want there to be a cultural change because at the moment Coles and Woolies are monstering smaller operators out of business. Uh, I want to see a fair go for farmers. Angus Taylor, you saw there, he helped design this policy, but it really, really was pushed by the Nats. Yeah, right. well, they, they've been advocating it for a long time, well before the cost of living crisis. Look, I don't think it hurts the coalition with the voters on the cost of living thing. I mean, every time you walk into Coles and it's 6.50 for a tub of marge, you think, you know, um, any, any, any pressure works. I mean, we can get hung up on free market principles and have they been violated. I would, I would argue. I mean, we've got this sort of situation at the moment, David, where you've got. You know, put aside the motive, you've got the free market party that was dragging its feet on climate change now advocating a national network of zero emissions power stations. Right? And then Government you've got, owned. And you've got Government people owned. on the left pro climate change, the, the, the intervention is saying it's terrible. I mean, the whole world's ass about when it comes to <laughs> that stuff. And, and it went out the window with the, with, with the energy market, as Amy referred to. The big stick legislation was Malcolm Turnbull and Angus Taylor bringing in forced divestment powers for generators and retailers, yeah. uh, where they could be split up if they abused their market power. Now, when they bought in those laws, um, I mean, the market, energy market's been intervened in forever. I mean, if you go back to the renewable energy target, if you really want to go right back, or the underwriting did, generation. Did that, did that big stick in energy make a difference? Well, <laughs> well, not really, because it hasn't had to be used, I guess. But at the time they passed that legislation, the Nationals, Little Proud and others, wanted to extend that go to further. the supermarkets as well. The, yeah, and look, a, even though some... some so it is a win for the Nationals. Yeah. Sorry, and even though the Libs thing. are unhappy, you know, to a degree, with the Nats getting wins now on nuclear... Clear on, on but this the Nats one, are also on the voice, on vapes, on a lot of Everyone's things. Unhappy. No, no, but like the, the, to go back to like you know the wider point here of the lack of substance. The nationals who want this stuff, like the divestment, the nuclear law, they're also unhappy because they're like you're well, you're swiping it. We're never actually going to get this no, they want because of the lack of policy background. Tell you what, the lack of planning. There's, there's, not, there's the, another one. Sorry, the gas yeah. trigger, the domestic gas security mechanism. That's an intervention where. Another Turnbull thing, right, where, they, where you can force the gas exporters up in Queensland if, then, if there's not enough on the domestic uh, front, they can mm. force gas into the domestic market. That's never been used, but actually the threat of that has worked. Just, um, yeah. so, just on the, the, the winter break that we're now in, uh, five weeks uh, away from Parliament, it'll be really interesting, I think, to see what the leaders do. Um, I understand there will be a Cabinet reshuffle probably later in the break before Parliament comes back. It's likely to be triggered by... A minister or two um, announcing that they're not going to recontest the next election. All eyes on uh, Linda Burney as far as that's concerned. But will Peter Dutton go back to the nuclear policy? Will he visit any of the sites that he's identified? For, for <laughs> he hasn't visited plans? them he... yet, so... Uh, yes. You reckon he will? Look, so, so his nuclear policy is in three stages. Right? He, he believes the waste issue was neutralised by Labor's embrace of AUKUS. So Labor's on the hook for a high-level waste dump. He put the sites out the other week because Labor was running these memes about you know, nuclear power yeah. stations in Hamilton Island or whatever else, so he wanted to shut down that. Mm. And by understand over the winter break, he will now release the costings. Well, it's more going to be a business case rather than costings. And that... Because I think they ran off script a while, a few weeks ago. They got stuck in the weeds on nuclear energy and the wackiness of all that. And you know, so they had a little bit of a blip in news poll for him. And what Dutton wants to do is bring it back to cost of living. So he'll bring out some modelling saying, look, power's going to be cheaper under us. And Labor will say, your modelling's rubbish. And they'll say, well, you, your yeah, modelling right, right. told us we'd have 275 right. yeah. bucks off our pelvis. So. Uh, a couple of things. The UK election, I mentioned the um, gains for pro-Palestinian candidates. big story, of course, was the, the change of government, the Labor landslide, and uh, Sir Keir Starmer, the new Prime Minister. Change begins now. <laughs> Four and a half years of work changing the party. This is what it is for. A changed Labour Party, ready to serve our country, ready to restore Britain to the service of working people. Just a small point. His kids aren't there. He never uh, appears with his children. The public don't even know the names of his kids. I just think it's interesting to compare... Neither did Gordon Brown. Yeah, well, there you go. Smart. But, uh, but, you know, they take the privacy of their kids a lot more seriously uh, over there. Look, uh, this change of government, though, was it a Labor win or a Tory oh, loss? No, it was a Tory loss. Yeah. It was absolutely a vote Fourteen against, years the, of against the Tory government. How many government. Prime Ministers? It's hard to like, keep Yeah, count. but, I mean, like, when you look at the actual vote breakdown, uh, they Labor only did, like, I think, 1% marginally better than they did in 2019 when they had that horrendous loss. Mm. Uh, you know, they did better in 2017 as a proportion of the vote. It was absolutely against the Tory party. And I think that the Labor Party in the UK is going to run into some of the similar 
issues that the Labor Party in Australia have, have run into, which is when you've had a small target strategy, when you haven't had a lot of policy, suddenly not being the other guys is not enough. People actually want to know what you're going to do in government. And the vote's interesting. Take a look at this. Uh, it shows you why they, uh, well, why there's a real push for electoral reform. They have a different system, uh, first past the post. Labor gets 34% of the vote, 63% of the seats in Parliament. The Conservatives, 24%. They only get 19% of the seats. Reform uh, did pretty well on the vote, 14%, uh, and only 1% of the seats. The Lib Dems um, had, a, had a good night. The Greens, too. It's, it's called the most disproportionate uh, result that we've seen because of first past the post. Anyway, interesting, um, interesting to note the, the differences in our systems. Yeah, I, I did a quick mud map the other day. With I did first, I ran the, ran the primary votes from the last election as if it, first past the post is the person who gets the most votes wins the seat. Even if you don't get over fifty percent, they don't do preferences. Yeah, and we'd have no teals, and we'd have two greens instead of four, and the liberals would have three or four more seats. So it's a. Mm. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's getting completely different. different. Yeah, well, people would vote differently no, if it yeah. wasn't well, they preferential. Would. We'll, we'll see. We'll see if they change it. And, <coughs> a, and a quick one finally, uh, Joe Biden. He did an interview, pretty important one, with the other ABC, ABC America, uh, yesterday morning, our time. It was seen as a crucial test after that shocking uh, debate performance. And look, he's made it clear he's going nowhere. It's a bad episode. Uh, no indicated any serious condition. I was exhausted. I didn't listen to my instincts in terms of preparing, and a bad night. A bad night. He said only the Lord Almighty would mm. convince him to get out of the race. Speaking so, of God in politics. Speaking <laughs> of religion mm. in politics. Mm. Um, but I, I saw one commentator, Katina, note that this is probably the worst of all outcomes because he's digging in. It wasn't as bad as the debate, but nor was that interview good enough to end this yeah, if the situation they're in. If the party's got to blast him out, like, that's a, you know, that, that's probably a, re that's a really bad look, right, to be having to try and to undermine. It was interesting, I was looking at the ages this year, you know, there's been a lot of focus on the age of um, Trump and Biden. It, the equivalent in Australia would be if John Howard and Paul Keating were running against each other in next year's election. Howard's 84, Paul Keating's 80 at their current age. Imagine that. <laughs> There no, thank you. There no. you All right, our panel, Katina Curtis, Amy Ramikas and Phil Curry will be back very shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I've come to the New South Wales State Parliament where the Behind the Lines exhibition is running until the 1st of August. And we're talking to the cartoonist of the year for Behind the Lines, the one and only Fiona Kataskis. It's all fun and games. Fiona is it's, the theme. Yes, yes. So I guess yeah. it's all fun and games unless you lose your pen. Then you can't draw conclusions, can you? You can't draw any conclusions. <laughs> well, this week the Federal Parliament was in a world of payment mm. um, as uh, Fatima Payman crossed to the independent and benches this week. Cross the floor and cross the party. Lovely Alex Ellinghausen photograph of her sort of out there on mm. her own. Mm. And it's a pretty lonely existence. This is a James Brickwood mm. photograph and it's just a beautiful representation of what happens at these events mm. because she's sort of surrounded by media. I imagine it must be really terrifying. Beautiful Matt Golding cartoon. <laughs> Consider your position if you want to sit with us on the wall. Yes, uh, I think as far as they're concerned they've got the uh, high moral ground there but I think that that might be a contentious uh, issue. Run us through this one, mate. OK, well, we've got uh, Albanese and Payman standing outside Camp Caucus and uh, the Prime Minister saying, you can be outside the tent and do nothing or be inside the tent and bash your head against the wall. And uh, as we can see, there's a few uh, caucus members in there um, where no one can see them. Beautiful, Kadelka. Um, we will not be lectured about Islamophobia or misogyny by that Muslim woman. Well, we've heard of the light on the hill, but this is more a light on the hill. <laughs> Magnificent. Kathy Wilcox is also another one in fine form. Well, you see, you need to understand the difference between the party platform and the caucus. Um, I thought this got really to the crux of it because oh, yeah. it matters very little to the people over there. This cartoon, I just think, is so powerful and such a, a great gut punch of a cartoon. We know that market forces are beyond what most politicians can control, mm. but uh, supermarket forces are something Dutton wants to control. He wants to be a real retail politician. <laughs> and David Rowe here has, uh, has, has picked up on the... Uh, LNP the for the people. Yeah, oh, yeah, no. Yeah. Yes. So, so, you know, 
You can get your uh, small modular reactor, Nile 12. The Costco models. Yes, small yeah. Model, or modular at least, reactor. Or at least you can put in an order and then in maybe 20 years after you put in a massive deposit and the price might change then. I do love David Littleproud in the in the baby seat here. Lovely Mark Knight. Tap, tap. Price check. Um, aisle five. It doesn't look like he's boosting consumer confidence much from the, the look of that, that woman and her child there. He might be biding his time, Fiona, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real question now whether Joe's got what it takes. It's a train crash. Yeah, well, they it? say politics is the art of the possible, but it just seems to be the art of, oh, my God, what the hell is going on? Yeah, and um, extraordinary um, judgments from the Supreme Court. Yeah. And Matt's drawn the um, the six Conservative judges here and the three Liberal judges. Biden here, can't finish a sentence. Trump, can't, can't start, start one. <laughs> you think he's probably receiving encouragement from one particular quarter that we wouldn't expect. Jill Biden here saying, well, isn't that lovely, but it doesn't say who it's from. Yeah, hang in there. You're just what we need. Inadvertently, Biden might be one of uh, Trump's biggest campaigners. Beautiful David Rose, SCOTUS Team 6. Well, uh, it was a case of I fought the law and the law bent to my will. <laughs> but uh, I do like this Brett Kavanaugh here because he likes beer. Me, the people, and uh, the emperor with no clothes sort of trampling over Lady Justice. Um, the cat in the hat is going to have an official portrait. Yeah. The cat in the hat sat well, for a portrait. I don't think anyone has ever called Bob Catter an oil painting, but um, no, no, he's, he's going to be one. Everyone was, was speculating what look because he's had a range of looks. What, he's had more than one hat? <laughs> <laughs> We've got Rachel Withers. It's got to be this one, though. She's she's a fan of the uh, the aviator glasses. Yeah, no. And then uh, Jonathan Green suggested this classic from last <laughs> year when he was dressed as a pig. And yeah. just that expression. It's such a it's such a catter expression, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Fiona, thanks very much for unpicking events this week, and I'll let you do the honours. Thanks very much, Mike. And back to you, David. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Mike. Let's get some final observations, Katina. Uh, just quickly, the midwinter ball raised three hundred and sixty thousand dollars for charity this year on Wednesday, so that was great. Um, and looking ahead to the election, talking about electoral reforms, we we should be finally going to see the much long promised laws. Um, uh, in the next session, hopefully, but um, there is some concern, growing concern, that those are not going to deal with the rise of AI and the problems that we might have with deep fakes at the current, at the coming election. Mm, a lot of issues there, Amy. Uh, dropped out on Thursday in amongst all of the uh, other events that were happening was the Hill Report response. So that was on the what the government was going to do for work for the dole and workplace providers, and no change. So people who'd been expecting reforms there, we're still going to have work for the dole, we're still going to have the private workforce providers receiving billions of dollars. And uh, you can imagine that there's a huge section of the community upset about that. Interesting. Phil? This is um, my list of constitutional changes that will never happen because we'll never have another <laughs> referendum. <laughs> I, we've now got four senators who entered the last parliament with a political party of which they are no longer a part and owe their seats in parliament to that political party, not because of their personal brand. Uh, Lydia Thorpe's one, Tammy Tyrrell and well, David Van, he was sort of pushed before he jumped. I, I, I think if you're not elected below the line, um, oh, there's, a, there's a reasonable argument that you've got to give that seat back, but it'll never happen, so I'm talking out my hat, but anyway, I've it's said, a, said it, my bit. No, no, it's, <laughs> a, it's a long list of constitutional changes that uh, maybe one day. All right, look, thank you. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Finally, politicians can often torture metaphors when trying to make a point, but this one from the BBC's election night coverage takes the cake. We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. The implosion of the Conservatives and the SNP has put wind in Labour sails. But the only reason we've got sails on the ship and the ship is ship shape is because Keir Starmer took the, the, the vessel from the shipwreck in 2019, rebuilt it and made it ship, you know, ship shape, shape and seaworthy again. You're making us all feel very excited about being here. <laughs>